uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the um, radial side of the wrist and the scaphoid, uh, but the ulnar side of the wrist is an issue. And Tom Fisher brought up that a CT scan is very helpful in assessing uh, triquetral fractures that may be associated with uh, perilunates and the orientation of the fracture and, and how to fix it. Um, okay, so level five. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion and I wanna bring up Jesse's point, uh, which is an interesting one. Uh, there's a paper, I believe it was from Singapore, used uh, on arthroscopic uh, reduction and uh, pin fixation of uh, perilunates with outstanding results. That's with no ligament repair. That's just cleaning the joint out, reducing it anatomically and pinning it. The second is that late LT instability was uh, uh, identified by Lichtman. And in the, back in the day, the LT uh, interval was not pinned. So it's the pinning more so than the ligament uh, repair that's the important thing. So goal number one, anatomic reduction. Two, stable internal fixation. Uh, three, actual ligament repair is less important, but I do repair the SL. Uh, proper pin placement is, is critical uh, when you are uh, addressing these. You gotta be strategic. And so uh, in this instance, uh, the pins that you see there are bad pins. The pin uh, over the radius is gonna impinge on the radius and cause some soft tissue irritation and may migrate. Uh, the pin more distally is gonna irritate the, uh, uh, the extensor tendons and they're gonna pus out. Uh, and then the third is you never want to uh, penetrate the subchondral plate uh, because these pins can migrate and uh, scuff up the uh, radius. So uh, my ideal pin configuration is, is this uh, the scapho, oh, sorry, scapho lunate, that's a typo, scapho, uh, capito lunate, scapho capitate and triquetral lunate. So this is, uh, to me, an ideal uh, pin configuration, uh, as you see here. And I like the triangle. I think the triangle makes it more stable. Um, and on the lateral, uh, you want the uh, scaphal lunate interval reduced, the lunocapitate interval reduced. And as I was preparing this talk, this was sort of my uh, ideal uh, pinning. And then I looked and I realized that the LT is not quite right. So uh, it's kind of funny because I was using this as an example for years. It's not, the LT joint is not totally reduced there. Uh, if you have a lunate dislocation, pre-reduction makes for a safer approach. If, uh, if you need to go volar, the, the carpal tunnel is distorted by the lunate. Uh, you have to be very careful uh, that you don't uh, damage the median nerve. So start proximally. Uh, and the distal uh, antibrachial fascia and work proximal to distal and protect the, uh, protect the median nerve as you're exposing it, okay? But in general, I like to go dorsal because the view is better, the reduction is easier, you can fix the scaphoid, you can fix the scaphalunate. Uh, I go uh, volar uh, if uh, there's an irreducible lunate dislocation, uh, if with carpal tunnel syndrome, again, the carpal tunnel is distorted and then I fix the capsule while I'm there but otherwise I don't routinely uh, go volarly. Those would be my indications to go volar. Irreducible carpal tunnel. Uh, this is a cadaver, I'll just go through the, the steps. So for a dorsal approach, a dorsal longitudinal incision, think maybe this patient will need a wrist fusion in the future, uh, put it in a place where you could fuse the wrist later. Uh, I go through the third compartment, as you see there, extend into the second compartment, and then dissect off the uh, radius here. Uh, this is a cadaver. You can see the dorsal uh, radio triquetral ligaments intact, but usually that's been disrupted uh, by this injury. You can see the uh, scaphal lunate injury and the capitate. Uh, as Jesse mentioned, uh, there are often osteochondral uh, uh, fragments and you can see here, uh, the head of the capitate has lost articular cartilage and I inspect the joint document in my op note uh, and debris. Okay, then my next step is while the, uh, while the uh, perilunate is still dislocated, I uh, place a, uh, a 0 0.062 uh, inch K wire from the capitate into uh, now through the second intermetacarpal space. So this is uh, kind of something I learned from uh, rheumatoid uh, wrist fusion surgery from my, my mentors. You have to make sure that it's a little bit ulnar. If it's radial, it's gonna end up in the, uh, in the capitate. If it's radial, it's gonna end up in the scapal lunar interval. So you wanna have it that way, and then I withdraw it, as you see here. So it's coming out the second intermetacarpal space. You wanna make sure it's gonna line up 
uh, well and not be in the scaphal linear interval. And then I take a look and uh, it's interesting, usually with isolated uh, scaphal linear tears, the, the scaphal linear ligament uh, ruptures on the scaphoid side and you re reattach it to the scaphoid. Oftentimes with perilunate injuries, it's either a mid substance or uh, sometimes off of the lunate actually kind of backwards. So the next step for me is to uh, is to take a look and see because uh, the real estate market is tight um, to see if I'm gonna use anchors where they're gonna go. Uh, and I like to place the anchors first because you can pass a pin uh, through around an anchor, but you can't pass an anchor in a place where the pin has already been, uh, been placed. Okay, so I put the anchors in. Uh, and then for me, it is, um, it's a little bit of a Rub Rubik's cube. So you can either um, reduce the scaphoid and lunate first or reduce the capitate and lunate first, but it, it all has to sort of go together. So next is uh, be strategic about the joysticks. Do you wanna put some joysticks in that are fairly stout that you can control the scaphoid lunate interval uh, with, uh, but put them in a place where they're not gonna be in the way when you place your pins. So uh, next step is I cheat. So this pin is placed percutaneously and then I placed it uh, superficial to the scaphoid so I can see the trajectory. You don't need a C-arm. You're distal to the styloid. Make sure it's going at the right angle before I have the resident or fellow uh, uh, drill it. So um, the next step is like I said, either reduce the scaphoid or the capital lunate first. Uh, and I used to do capital lunate first, but oftentimes the scaphal lunate doesn't reduce properly if you do that. So I put the scaphal lunate in pin in first and then advance the capital lunate pin. Then you got to look critically. Okay, so looking critically here, uh, it looks pretty good in terms of the gap. But to me, if you look here, that doesn't look quite right. That's a little bit of a V. Uh, it shouldn't look like that. And this is what it looks like if you look a little more volar. So the uh, proximal row, the bones are rotated with respect to, uh, to each other, okay? So it's important to keep that in mind. If you uh, use straight pins, it's hard to control them. So what I like to do is bend the pin. Uh, you can get a little bit more of a 3D kind of uh, control of the, uh, of the pins. Uh, a clamp is uh, helpful, although again, you can gap on the volar side if you over uh, tighten it. So you got to be careful about that. There are some uh, guy, um, some sleeves that you can use as a clamp to place over pins. Uh, we don't have them. But here's a better reduction. You can see there the gap is uh, reduced. The lines are parallel. You can see, and that looks good on the left-hand side. So then I put the uh, capital lunate pin in. So that construct is relatively stable. Although, as Jesse mentioned, it could still slide with, uh, with K-wire. So you got to be careful. Uh, then, I put a scaphoid capitate pin in. Remember that the distal pole is more volar, uh, so that you're going to end up distal and uh, distal to the styloid, and it's going to be a little bit more volar. I put that in percutaneously as well, uh, and then an LT pin, and I do the same thing. I cheat, so the, I place the pin so I can see it under direct vision. Uh, it reduce the uh, LT interval and advance the pin that way. So uh, then I'll remove the joysticks. Uh, oh, the other thing is I also, it, I usually these days, I will put a, a second K wire from the scaphoid into the lunate if I'm using pins rather than a screw, because it can still uh, gap with just one pin, even if you have a scaphoid capitate pin. So, and I try to make them so they're not to totally parallel as you see here. Okay, then remove the joysticks and repair using the pre-placed uh, anchors. Uh, you can use the dorsal intercarpal uh, ligament if, it, if it's not ruptured to augment the dorsal scapulinate ligament fibers. So I don't go volar, just dorsal there. Final product, uh, look critically, make sure everything lines up. Uh, cut the K-wires deeper than you think. I haven't had any problems uh, with the radial sensory nerve putting them in percutaneously. It's harder getting them out. <laughs> On the owner side of the wrist, if you cut them just under the skin, they always bother people. They end up eroding through the skin. You have to cut them deep. Uh, and th I think of it as a list frank injury. Don't think of it like a distal radius fracture. It, this takes a long time to heal. And so I say eight to 10 weeks, they're in a cast. I take them back to the OR to take their pins out. 
Uh, remember, there uh, are often associated injuries, as Lauren mentioned. And if you ever see a scaphoid fracture with an ulnar styloid fracture, think that this is a trans scaphoid perilunate uh, variant like this one here. I like this just because it illustrates the injury all, all across the wrist, like one of uh, Lauren's uh, examples. Uh, here was a trans a styloid with a soft tissue injury, and you could see that the styloid is very comminuted. Um, and I used uh, an external fixator to protect it uh, because of the soft tissue injury. Uh, and I'll conclude with this one. Uh, this is a who, uh, who knows one. And uh, oftentimes, I would never get a CT scan uh, beforehand. I'd like to get this thing reduced. But so uh, here's one. It just looks kind of crazy. Uh, you can see that there's definitely a perilunate the dislocation component to it. Uh, and it's reduced. And now we can see this ulnar styloid fracture, you can see that there is a scaphoid fracture, but the proximal pole of the scaphoid is not oriented properly and it's not completely reduced. So here's a re-reduction um, in the emergency department with a uh, cast on. And you can see that you knew that there was a scaphoid fracture, but now you also see a scaphalunate ligament tear. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, it can happen. It's, uh, it's not that common. Uh, it's interesting to think about conceptually the uh, if the scapho if the scaphoid breaks the scapholunate ligament will never tear but the uh, if the scapholunate tears first you could get a scapho scaphoid fracture and here's the intraoperative you could see uh, the scaphoid I like this illustration because you could see the osteochondral injury on the capitate and the dorsal scapholunate ligament fibers can double in size before they rupture. So it can lengthen 100% before it fails. Uh, so it can be functionally incompetent, but actually the fibers look like they're intact, as you see here. You can see the gapping. And here you have to be very strategic again with, um, with your pin placement. So you want to use a smaller screw in the scaphoid so you have room to put, uh, put pins in. And then just in that instance, just imbricate the scaphalunate and it'll always gap a little bit. Um, so in summary, it's like a Rubik's cube, be strategic. Uh, anatomic reduction is critical. Stable pin placement, avoid pin problems. Make sure you cut them deep enough. Because if the, if the pins erode through the skin, it's, it's a bad problem, especially if it happens early. Critically assess the radiographs during each step. And I always, before the surgery, hang some crepe. A stiff but stable and relatively pain-free wrist is a win. Thanks.